This is a video record of our 2014 tour of Italy trip. This is part one. In this part, we visit London, Rome, Monte Cassino, Pompeii, Sorrento, and Positano. We were stopping in London first so we could spend a half day with Jane and her daughter Natalie. As usual, we started our trip at LAX. This time we were able to relax in the first class lounge there because I had booked two first class flights to London, one on United Airlines and one on Iceland Air. I had booked us on Iceland Air because it had the cheapest first class seats available. We left LA on July 14th and flew on United to New York where we spent the night. The next day, July 15th, we had to kill time until 9 o'clock that night when our Iceland air flight left New York. After boarding, we were more than pleased with how roomy the seats were. Not only that, but the service was superb. The flight would be in two parts. First, we would make a scheduled stop in Reykjavik, Iceland. Then, after a short layover, we would take another flight on to London. The first flight took about six hours. We arrived in Reykjavik at about seven o'clock in the morning of the 16th. While we were waiting for our connecting flight to London, I taped Robin at one of the airport restaurants. We just landed in Iceland and uh, can't believe it. We've touched a country that Karen hasn't been in yet, which is a first. Uh, it's seven o'clock in the morning and we're on our way to seeing Jane in London. So we're really excited. This has been a very long, long drawn out trip, but we're on our last leg, so that's really exciting. We're gonna take off in about 40 minutes. And um, we had uh, maybe about, I think Norm and I slept about maybe three or four hours last night. So hopefully we'll last during the day. But um, this is the last leg of a two-day journey getting here. Today is July 16, 2014. And uh, we're on our way, last day today. Seeing Jane tomorrow, we're on our way to Italy. <laughs> so this is, this is the airport in Reykjavik. We only spent about 45 minutes there at the airport, then we got on another Iceland Air flight and flew to London, England, arriving on July 16th at around 12 o'clock in the morning. Our plane flew a very interesting route on the way to the airport. We circled around London itself. Here you can see the London Eye, which is a huge Ferris wheel marked with a 1. Then the Houses of Parliament mark with a 2, then Buckingham Palace mark with a 3 in the upper right. Then the plane turned to the right, allowing us to see Tower Bridge mark with a 1, and the Tower of London mark with a 2. As the plane completed its turn, we could see again the London Eye and the Houses of Parliament. So we landed and then we went through customs and then we got our luggage and we were walking through the terminal and I all of a sudden saw this blur running by me and it was Jane running to give a huge hug to Robin. We had met Jane years ago at Disneyland and had kept in touch for all these years. Jane and her daughter Natalie had driven to the airport to spend the afternoon and evening with us. When all the hugging and kissing was done, Jane drove us to our hotel near the airport. Then we all got on the subway and rode into downtown London. We got off the subway at the embankment station next to the Thames River. It was at that point that Jane said she had a surprise for us, but we didn't have any idea what it was going to be. Jane had reserved a luncheon river cruise for us, which we enjoyed immensely. After we finished the cruise, we walked to the Houses of Parliament and to Big Ben.
Big Ben, of course, is attached to the Houses of Parliament, and while we were walking around, I asked Jane if they had ever gone inside. She said no, they hadn't. So just for the fun of it, I asked if there was a way we could get in to view the Houses of Parliament, and they said there was. So we all got passes and went in to see both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. After we toured Parliament, we hopped on the subway and went to Leicester Square, where we had dinner at a place called Muriel's Kitchen. That's it on the ground floor of the building with the purple lights. This whole area is London's theater district. We ate outside and enjoyed the balmy evening. The next morning, July 17th, we returned to the airport ready to board the flight to Rome. But I made a rookie mistake. I packed my bottle of contact lens wetting solution, which the TSA promptly confiscated. This was the only bottle I had, so I hoped that I could find a replacement when we arrived in Rome. The flight to Rome was uneventful. We arrived around noon. We had some difficulty finding our luggage, but finally we got it. Luckily, I had pre-reserved a limo and driver who greeted us with a smile and a sign with our name on it, something that I had always wanted. After a pleasant ride, the driver dropped us off at our hotel, the Il Cantico, which used to be a Catholic monastery. It was converted into a hotel two years before we arrived by the owners, the Order of the Franciscan Monks. As we expected, the room was spartan but nice. The hotel was about a 20-minute walk to St. Peter's Cathedral and the Vatican. This was the view we had out of our hotel window. Note all of the TV antennas. So here is an aerial shot of Rome taken from the top of St. Peter's Cathedral. The two most important landmarks are the Castle Sant'Angelo and the Colosseum. We will see both of these later. After we found our room in the hotel, we immediately set out to see St. Peter's. On the way, we passed a pair of Swiss guards that helped protect the Vatican. Of course, Robin couldn't resist stopping for a picture with them. After a hot 15-minute walk, we arrived at St. Peter's. Okay, here we are, our first day in Rome. It's uh, about 1.30 in the afternoon. It's Thursday. July 17th, we just flew into Rome Airport and we're at St. Peter's. And up on the top here is the statue of Christ in the middle. And then fanning out on either side of him are statues of the 12 apostles. This is the, that's the entrance, that's the main entrance to St. Peter's. And over here is Vatican. This is where Pope lives. And all of this is part of the Vatican. Okay, first impressions. Oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. Over here. Over here. This is so overwhelming. I can't, I can't believe I'm actually here. This is like a lifelong dream for me to be here. After we finished taking in St. Peter's, we walked to one of the streets outside of the plaza in front of the cathedral. We wanted to try some gelato, so we found a gelateria and ordered two gelatos. We just about died when the man gave us our bill. It was $12 per gelato. That was the first and last time we were suckered during this trip. We walked back to our hotel to rest and have dinner in the hotel. That night we walked back to St. Peter's to get some night shots of the cathedral. We had arrived two days early to be able to get one day of sightseeing on our own. We got up early the next morning and walked to the subway and rode to the Colosseum. I got this picture off the internet, but don't let it fool you. It was wall-to-wall -wall people on the trip there.
We got off at the Coliseo stop and walked out to the site of the Coliseum. The first place we visited was the Palatine Hill, which to get to you had to walk through the Arch of Titus. So this is the Palatine Hill. This was the place that the emperor lived and all of the wealthy people lived. This is the Palatine Stadium and this is where they held games for all of the wealthy so they didn't have to mingle with the hoi polloi. These are some of the remains of the palaces on Palatine Hill. The area in that little valley there with the white dirt is the Circus Maximus. This is where they held the chariot races like in Ben-Hur. This is on the far side of the Palatine Hill. This is the view of the Colosseum you get from the Palatine Hill. In this view, you can see the dome of St. Peter's Cathedral. At the other end of the Palatine Hill is the Roman Forum. This was the center of Rome and where the Roman government met. And here again is the Palatine Hill. So here is the beginning of the Roman Forum. You can just make out the Arch of Titus in the background. This is a recreation of the uh, Roman Senate. The original was destroyed years and years ago. After we left the Roman Forum, we walked back to the Colosseum. This is a shot from inside of the Colosseum. This is the center of the Colosseum. This was originally covered with a wooden floor. So everything that you're seeing here is where the uh, gladiators would dress and get ready, where they would keep the animals. Uh, that's the behind the scenes of the Colosseum. Right outside of the Colosseum is the Arch of Constantine, shot from inside of the Colosseum. Scanning to the right, you see more of the Roman Forum and where we had gotten off of the subway around the corner to your right. We took the subway back to our hotel and rested up until 5 o'clock that afternoon when we met our tour guide for the Italy tour, Chris Daly, as well as all the people with whom we would be traveling on the tour. After our group meeting, we all walked down to the main street, boarded the bus which we would use throughout the trip, and took an evening bus tour of Rome. Some of the sites we passed included the monument to King Emmanuel II, who unified Italy into a single country in 1861, and the Library of Archaeology and Art History, from whose balcony there on the second floor, Benito Mussolini gave many of his speeches during the Second World War. Here's a picture shot during the war from the reverse angle, and over on the left you can see the monument to King Emmanuel II. We also got to see the outside of the Colosseum towards the evening. And finally we got our first view of the Castle Sant'Angelo. The following morning we met our Rome guide, the lady in the green dress, who took us around Rome all day. The first place she took us was on a tour of the Vatican, followed by a tour of the St. Peter Cathedral. Unfortunately, none of the video I shot was usable in this movie, so the following segments of the Vatican are from Robin's still pictures. This spiral staircase was part of the original Vatican building and was used regularly by Michelangelo as he painted the Sistine Chapel. At one point in the tour, we walked past these windows which gave us a spectacular view of Rome. The 
highlight of the Vatican tour was seeing the Sistine Chapel. This is a view of the anteroom just before you see the Sistine Chapel. The following two pictures are from the internet because we were not allowed to take any pictures or video of the Sistine Chapel. The following pictures show the inside of St. Peter's Cathedral, probably the most beautiful in the entire world. The most famous work of art in St. Peter is the Pietà by Michelangelo. It sits behind a piece of bulletproof glass because many years ago an insane man came in and took a hammer to it. It was restored, but they never wanted to take a chance like that again. That afternoon we met up again with the tour guide who took us on a walking tour of Rome starting with the Forum from this angle. We walked through many little back streets like this one and uh, were really amazed by the architecture that we saw. We made a stop at the Parthenon, one of a handful of intact structures that remain from the Roman period. It was completed in 123 AD and it is still the world's largest unreinforced concrete dome. It has been in continuous use throughout its history. We next stopped at the Piazza Navona. The assassination of Julius Caesar took place here at the Theater of Pompeii and not in the Roman Forum as has been portrayed in popular literature. That evening we were treated to a farewell to Rome dinner at the Opera Restaurant. And here is where the restaurant got its name, Local Opera Singers. The food was very good and included wine and conversation about the upcoming trip. After dinner, we all walked across the street and over a bridge to get a close-up view of the Castle Sant'Angelo. This was how we ended our tour of Rome. The following morning we departed for our next stop, Pompeii, but before we left I had an opportunity to find a pharmacy and buy a bottle of wedding solution to replace the one confiscated in London. The next morning we were all packed up and ready to start our tour of Italy. We boarded our bus and started driving south towards our first destination, Monte Cassino. Right from the start, Robin and I kind of took over the back of the bus and we held it for the entire trip. Here I am getting hunkered down with my trusty iPad as we left Rome. From Rome, we headed south about 80 miles to our first stop, Monte Cassino. Before I begin the video of Monte Cassino, I feel it necessary to provide some background information so you will know the significance of this stop. 
1943, the drive to retake Europe from the Nazis started with the invasion of southern Italy and then moved north towards Rome. To stop the Allied advance, the Germans had stationed soldiers along the middle of Italy in a line called the Gustav Line, with Monte Cassino at its hub. A multinational Allied force including American, British, Indian, Australian, New Zealand, Polish, Canadian, Gurkha, and South African soldiers was stopped by the Germans at Monte Cassino. The Germans had control of Monte Cassino as well as the Roman Catholic Abbey on its peak. When several Allied attacks on Monte Cassino failed, the Air Force bombed and destroyed the Abbey, but this actually made the situation worse. Here is the Abbey after the bombing. In the end, the Germans were forced back towards Rome, but at a cost of 55,000 Allied casualties and 20,000 German casualties. The Abbey was rebuilt after the war, and the land at the foot of Monte Cassino became a cemetery for the soldiers killed there. We stopped at this cemetery, which you will now see. After we left Monte Cassino, we drove another hour south until we arrived at the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. Again, I must pause for some background information. Pompeii was a thriving Roman city during the height of the Roman Empire. Here is an artist's rendering of Pompeii. Note Mount Vesuvius in the background. And here is a rendering of the interior of one of the wealthy Pompeii citizens. In AD 79, Vesuvius erupted and buried the city under a thick carpet of volcanic dust. 2,000 people died and the city was abandoned for almost as many years. When a group of explorers rediscovered the site in 1748, they were surprised to find that underneath the thick layer of dust and debris, Pompeii was still mostly intact. Now here is the video we shot at Pompeii. Note Vesuvius in the background. The man with the white umbrella was our local guide on the tour of Pompeii. This area belonged to a school for gladiators. This is a row of what used to be shops and stores. We saw this all over Italy, running water everywhere. It seems that Italy is at the foot of the Alps and much of the water from the Alps flows directly into Italy. So even though they have about the same climate as we do in Southern California, they never have a drought. Some of the buildings remained intact. In these buildings they have placed the plaster molds of the people who died in the eruption. You can see one in a glass case in the middle of the freeze frame. Again, this is a plaster mold of one of the bodies. It is not the actual person. After we left Pompeii, we drove about 10 miles south and arrived at the beautiful city of Sorrento.
Our hotel was in the hills above Sorrento. The drive up was beautiful. Here's the entrance to our hotel in Sorrento. Okay, here's our room in Sorrento. Hi, Holly. Check this out. Sorrento. Oh, yeah. Can't get any better than this. Check it out. Yep. This is fabulous. Gorgeous everywhere you look. There's the bidet. And the night. And out here is the world's smallest balcony, but it's a balcony. And then here is the view that we have. Way over there in the distance is Vesuvius and Naples. So after we checked into our hotel, we boarded this van for an optional side trip they offered to Positano, one of the towns on the Amalfi Coast. The drive along the coast was spectacular. They stopped at points along the way to allow us to take pictures. Here's a picture of what we think was a private beach. At some points it even looked like the road to Hana in Hawaii. Then we arrived at the top of Positano. So after the van dropped us off at the top of Positano, we walked down the windy streets to the ocean. So here's the beach at Positano, and this is the view looking back up. So I think Robin liked it here just a little bit. Well, maybe more than just a little bit.